Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. We're glad to have the visitors. It's always good to be in God's house and here where it's cool and good air-conditioned building. And you can relax and enjoy the things of God and really sing out and praise the Lord. And let's worship God today in spirit and in truth. Uh, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're coming to you live from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. So I hope that we can be a real inspiration. I want you now to take your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 16. On last week it happened, a prediction I made, which anyone could have made the prediction. I made a prediction whenever they overturned the death penalty of one of the mad dogs that helped kill the old day family here a few weeks ago, that this other one whose trial was coming up, that they would also overturn his and relieve him from the death penalty. They didn't even have to have a trial. They went ahead and overturned it anyway. And so they give him uh, what they call a life sentence, which is an insult to the intelligent people. Law-abiding citizens call something like that a life sentence. When on you serve about three or four years, and you're out. Now, this is my prediction. In the very near future, they're going to overturn the death penalty of Carl Isaac, the most wicked, cold-blooded murder, one of the most dangerous men that ever walked in shoe leather in the state of Georgia. And they'll overturn his conviction. And those men have been in jail now for some period of time. They'll take that into account. In a very few years, all four of them will be back out on the street again. So you see, we don't have any uh, judicial, criminal judicial system in America. Sad, it's very sad. Now, I'm going to say something else, whether you like it or not, while you turn to Luke chapter 16. If this democratic machine goes into the White House, better look out. Amen. This land is going to be filled with criminals. Amen. Because that man that's running for president, he believes in letting them go home on the weekend. I don't care how many people have murdered. And he has a card. He's a card-carrying member of the ACLU, the Antichrist American Lunatic Union. He's a member of that outfit. He has a card that he's a member of that outfit. That's a crime-loving, anti-Bible, anti-Christian movement. Now, whether you like it or not, I don't care. I'm telling you the truth. I feel I have a heart for our poor law-abiding citizens that have to suffer at the hands of these hardened criminals and our rotten judicial system doing nothing about it and those three stooges in Atlanta that overturn uh, the death penalty for the mad dogs that killed the all-day family and that jerk that run almost the wheels off his automobile going down and making love to Carl Isaac until he run there and run to Atlanta until he helped get them to turn the decision they go and ask the God in the day of judgment and all the crime and all the evil and the money the law-abiding citizen has to pay in their tax money to feed those mad dogs um, as long as they live they go going to give an account of it in the day of judgment when they face the judge, Almighty God. And then if that machine goes in in November, they're going to fill all the vacancies they can with liberal judges. That means that they're going to be more criminals turned loose. It's gotten a place today where they, you wonder whether or not it, or it's a waste of time to call a jury together and uh, get somebody convicted because if you have 11 people they'll take a cold-blooded murder and do what God said do with him give him death then you're going to have a Judas Iscariot on there that that's not going along with the other group or the other 11 that's, they'll have it reduced to what they call life which is a joke the average life sentence in America are you listening to me what they call a life sentence I don't know why in the world they call it a life sentence it's an insult to the average intelligent person, and that is four and a half years. Four and a half years. While you get more time for going into a dry goods store and picking up a pair of underwear and, and putting it on your coat and carrying it out than you would for killing a man, it's pitiful. 
it said and said indeed. And the infidels and the liberals and the God haters and the crime lovers and those that have no feeling for the victims of those that's been slain and the way their loved ones have been treated don't like for me to preach like this or talk like this. But I got conviction and I got a heart and I'm concerned about law-abiding citizens. And if you don't like it, you can leap it, lump it, sit down, jump up and bump it or whatever you want to do. It's the truth anyhow. And you know it's the truth. Now that's not my sermon. I'm not going to pass the offering pans again. Uh, for that, I'm going ahead and read my text in a moment. And you turn to Luke chapter 16. I'm going to speak on the subject, the contrast between heaven and hell. And this will be tape number 339. Tape number 339. You can write in and say, Preacher, uh, give me the tape on, uh, send me the tape on heaven, the contrast of heaven and hell. Or you can just say, send me the tape number 339. I send these tape out for a gift of $3 for the tape and you can receive them by mail in the next day or so after you write for them. And remember, my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. And so I want you to pray for me. I want you to stand by this whole mission work. I want you to write to me, tell us about the broadcast, have them to tune in and get the message of blessed hope each day at 12 o'clock noon, Monday through Saturday through the Big John Station here in Athens, Georgia, WNGC. I appreciate that so very much. In Luke chapter 16, I'm going to read only two verses and use it as a text. I'm reading verses of 22 and 23. And it came to pass that the beggar died, was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seen Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now back in Old Testament days, you know, as well as I, if you know anything about the scriptures, that when people died, whether they were saved or lost, they went down into the heart of the earth. The saved people went down into paradise in Abraham's bosom. And the lost people went down into hell. There were two compartments down there. One was hell, the other Abraham's bosom. And all saved people landed in Abraham's bosom. Then when Jesus died on the cross and paid the sin debt, then the paradise was transferred from the heart of the earth up into the third heaven where it is today. Now Paul said he was caught up into paradise. Now paradise is up now in the third heaven. As far as we know, the paradise that was down in the heart of the earth is empty as far as we know. But the other side across the gulf is not empty. It's being filled every day. The wrath of God will come upon this nation, upon the, the world. Now I'm going to deal with my line of thought today that I announced contrast between heaven and hell. Now there, there is a contrast in their locations as I said a moment ago. Now hell is referred to as being down. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 23, And thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. The Bible lets us know that hell is down. It's in the heart of this earth, if you please. And it will be transferred, that is, the sinners will be transferred to the great white throne at the end of the millennium for judgment and then sent to the lake of fire. But until that time, they are screaming and crying and pleading and begging and burning and in torment and flame down in the heart of the earth. Heaven is referred to as being up. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, Jesus said, You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? Heaven is up, according to the Bible. Heaven is referred to as being above. In John chapter 6 and verse 38, Jesus said, I came down from heaven. So we know then hell is down and heaven is up. You must keep that in mind. There you have the contrast between the two. When that sinner dies in a matter of seconds after he draws his last breath, he's in hell. He goes down, right down into the bowels of the earth. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, The day thou shalt be with me in paradise, he went down to the heart of the earth. 
But when he came out, he took paradise out and transferred it back into the third heaven, as we said a moment ago. Then number two, there's a contrast in their description. The Bible says hell is described as a lake of fire. That is, it's a place of torment, place of flame, and eventually will be the lake of fire. Uh, that is why sinners will be sent there into the lake of fire later on after the great white throne judgment. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. That's coming a time when the devil himself will be cast into the lake of fire. That's coming a time when all sinners will be cast into the lake of fire. All the wicked, the ungodly, the hell raisers, the infidels, the Bible haters, the God haters, all going to end up in the lake of fire eventually. Now it's described as fire, whether it be down in the heart of the earth where they are now, because they said I'm tormented in this flame. Or whether it be at the end of the millennium when it will be the lake of fire. And then heaven is a place of eternal light. The word of God tells us in Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 and 5. And they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads and there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither the light of the sun for the Lord. God giveth them light. Heaven is a place of beautiful light. Now you won't need electric light bulbs uh, because Jesus is a light thereof. There be no darkness there. And so heaven is a beautiful place of light. And the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 3, that hell, or heaven rather, is a place of beauty. Now our finite minds today cannot explain or describe to you the very beauty of heaven. Now God doesn't tell us too much about heaven. Now you may say, Preacher Edwards, why doesn't God, or why didn't God tell us more about heaven? God told us more about hell than he did about heaven. I think the primary reason is, is because if God said too much about it, we'd get too homesick. We'd want to go before our time. Now when Paul was caught up into paradise, while he was up there in the third heaven, God told him before he came back, he said, now when you go back down to the earth, I don't want you to tell what you saw up here. Now why did God tell Paul, ask Paul not to mention what he saw in the third heaven? But you know the apostle Paul was never completely satisfied from that day until he died. I believe whenever he woke up every morning he'd say, Lord, is today the day when I get to go back to paradise? He looked forward to it. He said, he said that for me I'd rather depart and go on to be with the Lord. He said, for me, I'd rather just go on and be with God today. But for you, it's better I stay down here to help you. And Paul had a longing to go home. That is to go back to the third heaven. It's a place of beauty. And if God said too much about it, we'd get homesick. We'd pray to die. We'd just want to go on before our time. So God didn't tell us a whole lot about that. But God did warn us about hell over and over again. Now, Jesus Christ is the greatest hellfire prophet that ever lived. And he said more about hell than all the other writers put together in the New Testament. And the reason Jesus preached and said more about hell is because he's the one that prepared hell for the devil and his angels. And he knows all about it. And he warns us about it. Number three, there's a contrast in the inhabitants. Now, you're not going to have the same people in hell that you have in heaven. That's coming to separation time. Hell will be inhabited by Christ rejectors, Bible haters, wicked, ungodly people that reject Jesus Christ. And heaven will be inhabited by those that receive Christ. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 that there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. And so there's coming a separation time. God Almighty is not going to let men uh, go into heaven that die wicked and ungodly. He's not going to do it. God has a place for them. If they had go to fake God into heaven, they'd probably try to tear up heaven. But God has a place for them, and the best God can do for them is send them down into hell in the prison house down there until the judgment. That's exactly what God does. Beloved, then people that are saved and love God and appreciate the Lord and love the Bible and true righteousness. Uh, God's not going to let them go to hell. God don't want them down there 
with those wicked, ungodly, God-haters and curses and blasphemers. God's going to take them to heaven where the greatest people in all the world have gone and where they're going now and where they will be going. That's coming to separation, great contrast as to the destination. Now we know sinners go to hell, Christians go to heaven when they die. And so there's coming a time of separation. Down here, you have to live among the ungodly. Now the Bible lets us know that. We're to live among them, witness to them, not to be of them, but we'll be among them and witness to them, try to win them to God. You don't have to partake of their evils, but God wants us to be a witness and a light that we might reach some before they die and go to hell. And so you're among the wicked down here. Many of you on your jobs, you have to endure cursing, blaspheming, criticizing of people that love God and so forth. You have to endure that. But that's come to separation time. That's coming a time when you'll go in one direction, they'll go in another if they fail to get right with God. Number four, there's a contrast in the desires of the inhabitants. Now those down in hell desire to warn others. Isn't that something? People down in hell have a tremendous desire to warn others that they don't come there. Now this rich man here in Luke chapter 16, he wanted somebody to warn his brothers. He said, I have five brothering. Send Lazarus back that he may uh, warn them. Send somebody back that they may tell them about Jesus. I don't want them down here. They are in people in hell today. Uh, they would give anything if they could just get out and come back and warn their loved ones about hell. Now if God would say, I'm going to open up hell and let the inmates out for a period of time, let them go back to the earth and witness to their loved ones up there on the earth, uh, then in five minutes' time there wouldn't be one left in hell. Every last one of them would be going from house to house of their loved ones, crying and weeping and begging them to get saved lest they die and come to that terrible place of torment. They're concerned about warning their loved ones. Those in heaven desire to walk in the light of heaven. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 24, and the nations of them which are saved will walk in the light of it. There's a heaven there where people desire to praise God, to sing, rejoice. In Revelation chapter 7 and verse 10, they cried with loud voice, saying, Salvation thy God, which sits upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. In heaven they're praising God, in heaven they're rejoicing, in heaven they're singing, in heaven they're fellowshipping, in heaven they're listening to wonderful music, in heaven they're having a wonderful time. And when God announces the saving of a loved one up there, and it's possible, he, he probably does, because the Bible said there's rejoicing in the presence of the angel of God over one sinner that repenteth. And I kind of believe that whenever you have a loved one, if you go into heaven and you have a loved one to get saved down here that you've been concerned about, that you'll know about it and you'll rejoice about it and praise God about it. I believe that there's rejoicing in the presence of of the angels of God. Amen. Now the angels could rejoice. But I believe it's others in the presence. Of the angels of God. Our love was just going on. Angels can't sing redemptive songs. They know it's about redemption. But God's people can sing the songs of the redeemed in heaven. And about the blood and so forth. And the redeeming power of God. And when you have a loved one that gets saved down here. I wouldn't be one bit surprised if. If it's not told to your loved one in heaven. They know about it. For instance you may be. A, you're, you're a good mother and you know God. And you've been praying for your son to be saved. And you prayed and prayed. And then you died. You go on to heaven. Without seeing that boy get saved. And you've prayed many times. And shed many tears. Late awake at night. Wanting that boy or girl saved. And then you go to heaven. And I believe when they get saved. You'll be informed about it. I believe that you'll know about it. And you can just rejoice and shout and praise God. I believe that. I have a precious mother in heaven. And she has some children that's not saved. But if they got saved. She has some that do know God. She has some that do not know God. And my mother's prayed for them and wept for them. And she wants them to meet her in heaven. And if they get saved before they die. I believe my mother will know about it and she'll rejoice and praise God 
that a child got saved down here upon this earth before he died without God. Oh, listen, people. Heaven is a wonderful place and you don't want to miss it. Hell is a terrible place. You most certainly don't want to go there. Then number five, there's a contrast in the activities there. Now the Bible tells us hell is a place of torment. I've heard people make this statement. They've said, well, if it's any hotter in hell than it is here, I sure don't want to go there. Well, a lot of you people have made that statement, no doubt some have. And you know how hot it is during these days and how hot it is today. Well, that's nothing compared with hell. Now, you're talking about heat and torment. If you don't like the heat, you don't like the fire, then you better get right with God. Because if you die without God, you're going into a blaze of fire. You're going into a place of heat. You're going into a place of torment. Hell is a place of torment, the Bible tells us. And down there, they're, they're tormented. They are, they're thirsty. They'd like to have just one drop of water. Down there, they're looking for confidence, but a confidence can find none. Down there, they'd give anything for relief, but they can't find relief. In hell, there's no relief. Now, God warns us about hell. You may say, now, preach Edwards, that's terrible. That's awful for people to go to a place like that. You don't have to go there. If you go to hell, it'd be because you didn't get right with God. When Jesus Christ came from heaven down to this earth and was born of the Virgin Mary, lived on the earth and there while he was up on the earth and time he went back to heaven he fulfilled 333 Old Testament prophecies predicting his first return a first coming fulfilled literally and minutely every one of them came down here and went back to heaven and he did that that you won't have to go to hell God doesn't want you to go to hell it's not his will that any should perish but if you go and reject Jesus Christ that's exactly where, you, where you're going that's the best God can do for you. You can't go to heaven. Where can you go? If you can't go to heaven up there among the saints of God and the people that love God and the greatest people that ever lived, if you can't go to where in the world are you going? All you say, preacher, there must be some place. Yes, there's some place. And that place is hell. That's the best God can do for you. He'll put you down there in hell and where you'll be there until the great judgment morning. When God will bring you out and you stand at the great white throne and be judged, the term your degree of punishment and sent to the lake of fire. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture in the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb, and the whole angel and the presence of the Lamb, the Bible tells us. That time is coming. Whenever sinners are going to be tormented in the presence of the Lamb and the holy angels, so will the beast, the false prophet, and the devil himself will go to the lake of fire. It's a place of torment. Torment. Down here, people, they are tormented by various things, and they hit it rough in the way of trying to make a living many times. They have many problems to confront them, but that's nothing compared to hell I've heard people say, well, if hell's any worse than what I'm going through now, I sure don't want to go there. No, you don't need to go there. You don't have to. Hell's worse than what you're facing now. I've heard people talking about war and combat, and it's bad. On the battlefront, I know by experience, I've been there. And I've heard soldiers call it hell. And I've heard others describe, describe it as hell. This is hell. This is hell. I, those are men that invaded Iwo Juma back yonder. Uh, uh, whenever they, the Marines invaded that little island in World War II, they said this is pure hell. Way they having to die and be slain on that little island. But that's not hell. That was terrible. That's awful. And all the men that have faced combat is terrible. What they have to suffer, that's not hell. Hell is far worse than that. If you don't want to get into something worse than that, you better get right with God. Now, hell is a place of torment. They're tormented, all, they're tormented and within this period of time. On and on, they live in torment. They don't get into rest day and night as we call it on the earth. They're tormented forever. On and on they go until the judgment and then the lake of fire. Heaven is a place of no tears. Down in hell, no doubt, they're weeping. Hell's a madhouse. Hell's a place where people are accusing each other for not leading them to God and 
uh, children accusing pirates for not leading them to God on the earth, not telling them about Jesus. Now down in hell, their sons pointing their finger in the dad's face and said, you'd have been a Christian, been a right kind of man. You could live for God and warn me to Jesus Christ. Now you're in hell, I am too. And they're cursing each other. Daughters are cursing mothers. That now if you'd have been the right kind of mother, I wouldn't be down here. And on and on they go. Day in and day out. If there's such thing as day and night down there. But it's a place of darkness. There's no real light there. And they're cursing each other. Blaming one another. Accusing each other. Down there in hell. Hell's a terrible place. A lot of tears down there. No, not a begging. A lot of pleading. A lot of praying. Why well, you never heard the lack of praying that's going on in hell today right now. But to no avail. But in heaven it's a place of service. In heaven there's no tears. God wipe away all tears. Over there the Bible tells us. And it's a place of serving God throughout eternity. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 3. A servant shall serve him. Now when you get to heaven. You're going to have the real joy of serving the Lord. And serving him in joy and happiness. And all throughout eternity you serve the Lord our God. Number six. There's a contrast in the way of entrance. Now hell is in it by unbelief and procrastination. Now people say, well, I don't believe in it. I, I'm not going to accept it. And others say, yeah, I believe in it, but I'm going to put it off for a while. That's procrastination. I, I, I'm going to wait. Wait until I get to be an old woman, an old man. I'm young. I'll have a good time. I'll take my fling at life. And when I get old, just before I die... Then I'll get saved and then I'll go to heaven. What a lie the devil's telling you there. A lot of people tried that and they're in hell today. You don't have, you don't have a lease on tomorrow. You may be dead before tomorrow night. I may be dead before tomorrow night. Beloved, we need to realize that we have no lease on life and we have no promise of tomorrow. And the devil tells you you're young, the, the land is filled with worldly pleasure that you can enjoy yourself and later on in life get right with God. That's one of the biggest lies the devil's ever spewed in your ears. And hell today's got millions of inmates there that believe that stuff. They believe later on they'd get right with God. But they died and went to hell. Many of them died suddenly. Many of them killed in car wrecks. Various other things happened to them. And they were snatched out. Oh, listen to me. Don't put off salvation any longer. And heaven... Is a place where you can enter in and rejoice and praise God. And but the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 1, He that been often reproved and hardness next shall suddenly be destroyed that without remedy. Now there's a lot of people dying today suddenly because of the hardening of their necks or their hearts against God. And God gave them their last chance and they rejected that and they were cut off suddenly. A lot of people in hell today cut off just like that. They had their chance. They had their chance, but they didn't take advantage of it. There's some of you right now listening to me. You've had your chance. You have your chance now. And if you don't do something about it, uh, then if you die and go to hell today or tomorrow or in the future, who can you blame? You blame nobody but yourself. You know, today you try to win sinners to God. Now listen to me. Let me have your ears. Today you try to win sinners to God, and a lot of them, about the first thing they'll bring up, well... Look at old so-and-so. He was a preacher and look at the terrible a scandal about him and all that money and all this kind of stuff. Start bringing up somebody uh, back yonder that did wrong and made a mistake. And that's not going to help them, not going to help anybody. Every man is going to give an account of himself to God. If every preacher goes wrong and every Christian backslides, that sinner is still going to answer God for himself. When you face God Almighty in the judgment, you can't bring up these people that's made mistakes and sinners that are backslidden on God. You, you can't bring them up expecting God to excuse you. God's not going to excuse anybody. God's not going to do it. You can say, well, the Lord, you know, so-and-so, he, he claimed to be, uh, well, God said, I'm not concerned about so-and-so. I'll take care of him. I'm concerned about you. Why didn't you accept Jesus Christ? Every man answers for himself. I don't care if all the world uh, turns against God. You're still going to answer to God for yourself. Heaven is entered by Christ through a door. That is, Jesus said, I am the door. Now you can go in. 
Jesus is the door, and the door is wide open today if you want to go in. Heaven is entered by a childlike faith. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as a little child, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. God can save you. Just come humble before God and repent of your sins and believe on Christ. God will save you. Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Somebody says, well, preacher, I'll tell you, I've just been a little bit too mean, ungodly, and I, I don't think God will save me. The devil will tell you that lie, and, and you're foolish to believe it. God will save any sinner that wants to be saved and means business. Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. God accepts sinners if they want to get saved. And you don't have to say, well, let me go out and, and see if I can straighten up some bad things I did. God didn't tell you to do that. Like the old song says, come just like you are without one plea. Well, it's thy blood that is shed for me. God wants you just like you are. You don't go out and straighten up anything. After God saves you, you can straighten up whatever you feel like you should straighten up. Then finally, number seven, there's a contrast in relation to Jesus. In hell, sinners are separated from Jesus. Jesus Christ is the greatest man that ever lived. Jesus Christ is the most precious person that ever lived. When we see the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to see the most wonderful person that ever walked on this earth. The Lord Jesus Christ. Sinners are separated from him forever. They can never live with him. They can never be around him. The only time they're going to face him is the great white throne judgment when they're judged. That's it. After that, they're separated from God forever. People in hell, sinners are separated now. They're going to be separated then. In heaven, the saints are with Jesus. Every one of your loved ones that's gone on to be with God you're with Jesus. Somebody told me the other night, I was over at Bob Jones University, and they told me about the great lemons. And this preacher is telling me about it. And he said, uh, he said, Brother Edwards, Grady is with the Lord. I mentioned Grady, you know, died uh, uh, Friday morning. They found him dead in his bed. He'd just been dead a very short period of time. His body was still warm when they went in to wake him up, and he'd gone. And this preacher said, Brother Edwards, Grady is with the Lord. And that's wonderful, be with God. You know when you leave here, you're going to be with God. You'll be with Him forever. Not only will you be with God, but you'll be with your loved ones that go there. Some of you got loved ones over there. I have and you have. And you get to be with them forever. Now, hell is a place where sinners are separated from God, but heaven is a place where they'll always be with God. In heaven, saints will be like Jesus. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, Beloved, now are ye the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what ye shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, but we shall see him as he is. So when Jesus comes, you're going to get a brand new body like unto the Lord's. He had a body of eternal youth. You're going to have a body of eternal youth. God give us a brand new body that will never grow old. And you get to be with him forever. I mean for millions of years i mean never to be separated from him anymore you live on you'll never die you'll never die if you know the lord jesus christ you live on forever you leave the tabernacle which you now live in but you're going to get a brand new one and going to be with the lord forever and forever you can't afford to miss heaven you just go on and gamble and die in your sins and go to hell it'll be your own fault I beg you not to do it. I plead with you not to do it. All you need to get right with God. You have no promise of tomorrow. And the Bible tells you so. You may put off Jesus now. You might put him off for the last time. If you're not right with God, you need to get right with God. Let's stand to our feet. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it. May somebody get saved today. May somebody... Flee the wrath to come. May somebody turn to God today. Father, use the message. Thank you, Father, for those that's been saved. Bless them real good and encourage them. Save some lost sinner, whether in this auditorium or whether out in the radio listen audience. Save somebody today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, while Debbie plays for us on the instrument, if you're in this building, you need to get saved right now. You ought to come down here. 
I'm not trying to intimidate you. I'll preach to people that walked out the door that never heard another sermon. I'll preach to people that walked out that door, died before the sun came up. I was in North Carolina a few years ago. I made this statement when I gave the invitation. I said there may be somebody in this building will never see sunrise. On the way home that night, a man died with a heart attack. Never even made it home. I'm not trying to intimidate anybody. I'm giving you cold facts. I preached a man under the tent one night. I said there may be somebody here will never have another chance. Next morning, 4 o'clock, a man died with a heart attack. We just don't know. Pays to be ready. If you're not ready, would you like to come for salvation or to join the church or to get, get back into fellowship? Is God speaking while we wait? While we wait, God speaking. If God is speaking, then you need to come. I brought the message God laid on my heart. God sent you here to hear it. Now the matter between you and God is what you're going to do about it while we wait.